Good evening. evening. I'm Don Clark, and I greet you as acting president and general counsel of the Chicago Theological Seminary. I hope that you've enjoyed our reception and will now enjoy our program and lecture, the 2017 Castaneda Scholarship Event. An evening of fellowship and learning that focuses on one of the interwoven commitments of CTS, justice and equality for LGBTQ persons in the churches and in the wider world. On this night when new threats of the misuse of the concept of religious freedom to condone and even encourage discrimination against LGBTQ persons and many others, it's fitting that we gather to speak of the contributions of sexual minorities to church, theology, and society. We're also very thankful and we welcome joining with Lambda Legal and presenting this program and working together in many other ways is Alexis in the room. I'd love to acknowledge Alexis and her presence on behalf of Lambda Legal. We also gather this evening at the end of the first day of the CTS Board of Trustees meeting and so I'd ask all the trustees who are here tonight to stand and be recognized. They're doing tremendous work on behalf of the seminary. They've already had a very full day and we thank them for remaining with us this evening to participate in this event. I'd also ask uh, those members of the CTS faculty that are here to be recognized, to stand and be acknowledged. The faculty, the heart and soul of this institution, we very much appreciate them. And finally, I greet our guest speaker, Jay Michelson, who will be introduced more fully later. But Jay, we look forward to your address and are grateful for all you do as scholar, teacher, lawyer, and activist to foster justice and mercy in line with CTS's mission. I welcome you all. Last year at this event, it had only been in some of my worst nightmares that I had imagined the scenario that we are now living. This CTS scholarship to encourage GLBTQI identified students is a tiny, tiny light lifted up, a little finger in the dike against the flood of bigotry, ignorance, corruption, and greed that drives the anti-immigration and anti-civil rights terrorism today. Gilberto Castaneda was a gay, undocumented man from Aguas Calientes, Mexico. He came trying to find himself on the run, you might say, an outlaw Christian. 
in toxic, homophobic, racist cultures both sides of the border. We knew him as an attractive, healthy, energetic young man with short brown hair and big brown eyes. He loved to pose for photos. And he rode the scariest rides in any amusement park. He worked long hours bagging carrots and washing dishes in restaurants in Bakersfield, California. He loved nice clothes, bought himself a few on a shoestring budget, and he kept them ironed. In the evenings, he also wrote letters to friends, played with our dog Chulo, and practiced his guitar, practiced the chords that went with the songs, the coritos that praised God and expressed longing to God. He never got the hang of different rhythms on the guitar. So he, his was the heartbeat, thumb, 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 around which we made our music. And he loved decorating for holidays. He loved to da vida a la casa, to give life to the house. He was at ease with almost anyone, including children. And he had the spiritual gifts of hospitality, of helping, and of faith. When Ted and I first met him in 1989, Gilberto was an economic and emotional refugee, feeling alone in his struggle against the soul-ravaging culture of homophobia, and scarred by a sexual attack by a teacher in a school, a seminary tract school, in Catholic school in Mexico. He found after that, for over a decade, his friends, his life, away from religion and away from the church. Until he came north, leaving his mother, friends, and an unfinished college degree in psychology. He came north in search of the something missing and was met by a young Mexican pastor, also named Gilberto, who was working with me in several United Methodist congregations in Bakersfield, California, both documented and undocumented folks. Gilberto Casaneda was the first new disciple from what came from what we called friendship evangelism. He stayed on <clears throat> to become a son, friend, brother. He lived with us for two years in Bakersfield and insisted on coming with us to Chicago when CTS asked Ted to come back in 1991. In order to help with the moving, Ted taught him how to drive and helped him practice driving our old van. I rode in the other car. Uh, all of that results in Ted's radical hair loss. <laughs> Gilberto quickly became active, part of life, at John Huss United Methodist Church in the Pilsen at Crossroads House, which was just here for uh, University of Chicago International students for many years, and at CTS, where he worked in the maintenance department and painted Susan Thistlethwaite's house on Kenwood. The guitar that Dow Edgerton gave him was his second most prized possession. The first was his Bible. He felt that grateful to have been found by God's saving love. Gilberto returned to Mexico in 1992 to help his mother move and to try to finish college. Later, he moved to Atlanta for what turned out to be a toxic relationship with a policeman who was also a closeted Baptist deacon. A lifetime of homophobia and denial together with this toxic relationship resulted in deferred diagnosis and treatment. And in August of 1994, he called and he said, Estoy enfermo. Puedo regresar a la casa. I'm ill. Can I come home? He arrived with one suitcase, that guitar, and his Bible, a thin, twiggy, tired version of himself. Despite immediate and wonderful help from Howard Brown Center and Northwestern Uni Hospital, he, medical in intervention came too late. Ted especially was with him constantly during his last three weeks of life, listening and talking, providing nursing care, and singing love songs to God, singing with him and then for him. And Ibrahim, who lived with us at the time, carried him downstairs the night we took him to the hospital for the last time. Beautiful, strong, peripatetic Ibrahim, a tall Muslim man from Senegal who 
also lived without U.S. documents. Ibrahim, who was morbidly afraid of illness, felt his heart freed for compassion by Hill's faith and his dignity. And he said, he's not heavy, I'll carry him. Gilberto wanted so much to live, to live as a gay man and Christian, to live self-accepting and free after all the years of hiding and self-hating. He wanted to use his gifts for God's agenda and maybe attend CTS one day. But he died on that August 29th, 1994 of homophobia and he died of AIDS-related infections. Later, in November of 1994, some faculty members and board members established the Cas Gilberto Castaneda Scholarship to honor this gay immigrant, and in so doing, honored Jesus Christ, the Lord of hospitality, by remembering one who could easily be forgotten, who was the salt of the earth, and was one of the least of these. He would have been 52 this year. In 1991, he wrote a farewell note to his Tokayo pastor friend, Gilberto Amaro, who had shared the gospel with him in California. I quote, I am guilty of wanting everything to be fantastic and full of color in this my new life. <clears throat> but I know for sure, but what I know for sure is that the connection between love and friendship and brotherhood will always, always exist in the world and in my life. We are so grateful that you join us in remembering him and in encouraging our students. You were born for just such a time as this. We thank you for your support. an old Yiddish song. I was wondering what to sing, and I asked Jay, and he said, go with something social justice-y. And the social justice tradition best expressed Jewishly is always in Yiddish. <laughs> Avram Risen was a phenomenal poet and songwriter. He wrote hundreds of songs. Some of them little kids throwaways, but always these Yiddish holiday songs tend to have a little hook into them, taking the forms of traditional Jewish observance of holidays and whatever and finding a way to somehow make them separate from the liturgical tradition and somehow about comrades coming together in socialist paradise, about <laughs> some way that the world will get better, and that's the spirit of this song. A song that says, no matter how far away, the time of love and peace, it will come. Und soll wie weit noch sein die Zeit von Liebe und von Scholm Doch kommen wird sie friert sie spät. Die Zeit, es ist kein Cholem. Doch kommen wird sie friert sie spät. Die Zeit, es ist kein Cholem. Ich höre das Lied. Liebe Fried, die mächtige Gesangen und jeder Ton von liegt so Ton, die Sonne ist aufgegangen und jeder Ton von liegt so Ton, die Sonne ist aufgegangen. Die Nacht, die Welt der Wacht, voll Hoffnung, Lust und Streben. Du hörst in der Luft, das Stimme ruft 
zu glück und Freud und Leben. Du hast in der Luft eine Stimme ruft, zu glück und Freud und Leben. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the good news of the new age, and curing every disease and every sickness. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask our God, source and sustainer of the harvest, to send laborers into the field. Such is the reason for this night, this annual celebration of the work of queer religious studies at this small and daring seminary. To remind ourselves of the teeming crowds of those who are harassed and in need of help and healing, in need of good news. To hear, a good, to hear again some good news to us and the call to go from this place out into the fields, the highways and byways where the discarded and downtrodden wander and to be about the identification of still more laborers, those who will heed their call, who, who need their call affirmed, who need education and nurture, who will go and serve far beyond these walls, far beyond our current imaginings. Here at CTS, my colleagues and I who read texts and traditions queerly and attempt to construct inclusive theologies do this work both for and with our students as one part of how we strive to fulfill the mission and commitments of CTS. And so this scholarship fund, and so this annual night of conversation and celebration. As you have heard already so eloquently from Rana, the Gilberto Castaneda Scholarship was established in 1994 in loving memory of Gilberto, one who did not have the opportunity to pursue theological education. And so it is fitting that he is presente in and through others who study here and then leave to serve in church and academy and social organizations in ways that foster the increase of justice and mercy for sexual minorities, and for us all. It is then my honor and privilege this night to name the 2017-18 Castaneda Scholars. But first, I would like any previous recipients of the scholarship to stand and be recognized.
Thank you for your witness, your work, and your service, and to the many others in this community who are doing this work as well. This year's recipients come from opposite sides of the globe. Our first awardee lives among the cornfields in rural Indiana and is a member in discernment in the Northwest Association of the Indiana Kentucky Conference of the UCC. Most often online, but on campus whenever she can, Z is able this whenever she whenever Z is able, this student embodies the dissolving of boundaries that Patrick Chang, Patrick Chang has shown to be the heart of queerness. Identifying as two spirit, weaving biblical traditions with indigenous spiritualities, Z is pastor, an activist, teacher, ritualist. In Zer MDiv Midler Review, Z wrote, when I, when I entered this journey, to heed the call God has placed on my spirit, my goal was not to merely survive seminary, but to take advantage of every opportunity that presented itself to enrich my understanding and to work at becoming more nimble in biblical interpretation and ministry, to continue to boldly witness and advocate, advocate for justice and mercy in this world, and to serve the people of God in whatever way the spirit leads. This Z has done and continues to do. For all she has done, for all she promises to do, for the call she, Z follows through, the road may not always be clear. I am so happy to name Lynn, please don't call me Linda Young, <laughs> a Castaneda scholar at the Chicago Theological Seminary for 2017-18. Our second awardee hails from Taiwan. He earned a BBA in information management and philosophy in 2001. In 2003, he attended the very first Pride March in Taipei, and his life changed. He discovered a church where it's okay to be gay and Christian, the Song Quain Lighthouse Presbyterian Church. When the pastor of Song Quain, a, a pioneer in LGBTQ Christianity in Taiwan, committed suicide in 2008, the student felt obligated to pursue formal theological education. Earning a bachelor's degree in theology in 2011, he immediately entered the MDiv program at Tainan Theological College and Seminary. He wrote his thesis on a queer rereading of Leviticus 18.22 and 20.13. Notorious texts indeed. This is not someone without courage. He was also named valedictorian. After completing an STM online here at CTS, he joined us in person this past fall as a PhD student. While accumulating degrees has not hindered his activism his public witness or his religious leadership, he is with us to pursue knowledge that fuels and directs liberative activism. His research resides at the intersection of biblical hermeneutics, critical theory, queer theory and theology, and the struggle for liberation of the marginalized everywhere, but especially sexual minorities in Taiwan who face a new consolidation of Christian discrimination and oppression for all that he has done, for all he promises to do, for the call he follows, though the road may not always be clear. I am so happy to name Wei Jen, and it's okay to call me Cherry, <laughs> Chen, a Castaneda scholar at the Chicago Theological Seminary, 2017. <laughs> Thank you. 
<clears throat> Thank you all. We now hear from another Castaneda scholar who is not able to be with us tonight and so leads us in a prayer of invocation via, we, via YouTube. Greetings and peace from Birmingham, Alabama. I pray to a gracious and loving God, and I invite you to join me in that spirit and in your own relationship to the divine. Let us pray. Dear God, we give thanks this and each day for Gilberto Castaneda and the ways in which his life continues to give life and spirit to so many. For this reason, we gather this evening to celebrate life and the acts of living. Life of joy and pain, of honesty and confusion, of hope, promise, and grief. We acknowledge the whole of life, dear God. We give thanks for your invitation to authenticity, to integrity, to the struggle of keeping it real. We lift up those who do not have that freedom. And on this evening, most especially queer folk and trans folk, gay and lesbian, intersex, bisexual, asexual, pansexual people everywhere, in suburban classrooms, on street corners, over dinner tables, in the State House and the White House, in airport security lines, in homeless shelters and in refugee camps, in daily encounters both large and small, and especially in our places of worship and supposed community. We pray for the freedom and dignity that you desire for all people. And we pray tonight for those things which nourish us all on the journey, for bread and kindness, for healing and wisdom, for friendship and beauty, for safety and well-being, for justice and mercy. In the name of all that is holy, we pray. Amen. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ken Stone, and I'm the academic dean at Chicago Theological Seminary and a member of the faculty. Uh, and I'm happy to welcome all of you here, whether you're joining us in person via live stream. In 2010, I had the opportunity to work with a small group of LGBTQ scholars to organize and lead the first of several consecutive summer institutes for younger LGBTQ scholars and activists in religious studies sponsored by the Human Rights Campaign and held at Vanderbilt Divinity School. Planning session over was, we've got to get Jay. I don't know Jay, but we did get Michael. And I quickly learned why colleagues have been so enthusiastic, charismatic, informed, well-connected, and just plain smart about religion and sexuality. And he's a lot of other things as well. Ordained as a non-denominational rabbi, J. Michelson earned his J.D. degree at Yale Law School and his Ph.D. in Jewish thought at Hebrew University. He maintains a high public profile as legal affairs columnist for the Daily Beast and as a frequent contributor to NPR, CNN, The Atlantic, the Washington Post, The Forward, and other media outlets. In 2010 and 2014, he won the New York Society of Professional Journalists Award for opinion writing. 
Dr. Michelson is the author of numerous books on a wide range of topics, including God versus Gay, The Religious Case for Equality, which was a finalist for a Lambda Literary Award, Evolving Dharma, Meditation, Buddhism, and the Next Generation of Enlightenment, and Everything is God, The Radical Path of Non-Dual Judaism. He's also the author of Redefining Religious Liberty, a landmark 2013 report on the right-wing religious liberty movement, and one of the first studies to recognize the strategy of securing religious exemption to, re to civil rights laws. He has held a number of teaching positions at such schools as Harvard Divinity School, Boston University Law School, City College of New York, and Yale University, and we are especially happy about his appointment as Affiliated Assistant Professor of Religion here at CTS, where he teaches for us regularly, primarily online. We look forward to his lecture tonight on the topic, Queering Jewish Theology. Please join me in welcoming Dr. J. Michelson. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you especially to, uh, to Ken for that introduction. Uh, thank you to uh, Acting President Don Clark, to Scott Haldeman, Professor Ted Jennings, and Reverend Rana Case, and to my colleagues and friends and students uh, here in the CTS community. It, it really is, I'll wait for that to happen. We joke that this is the sign that says the show's over. It truly, it truly is an honor uh, to be here and join such an amazing list of queer thinkers, doers, and dreamers uh, who have addressed you in the past. And I hope we all know kind of what we've got here. You know, there are really only a very few places like CTS in the world, places where progressive spiritual folks can do the kind of thinking and learning that I really do think will play an integral role in the healing of our society and our planet. Obviously, it's impossible to give a talk like this without noticing the gaping open injury to our body politic, uh, localized specifically in some of its most vulnerable parts. In fact, Ken and I went, went back and forth on the topic of tonight's talk. You know, I really felt that during the last few months to talk about anything other than resistance to white supremacy, despotism, militarism, cruelty, racism, sexism, fundamentalism, nationalism, to talk about anything other than resistance to those things was at the very least ridiculous, at the worst, complicit. And yet, we're all talking about that, including many people here, and many people who can speak from positions that I cannot. And I thought about the theme of the Castaneda lectures, and thinking about the long game as well as the immediate crisis, and thinking about making a Jewish contribution to this body of work. And I also thought, damn it, I'm not willing to let this regime take over every form of discourse that there is. So for me, this is personal as well as philosophical. As Ken just said, my primary career these days is as a columnist uh, for the Daily Beast doing political and legal writing. I spent all day today writing two articles and doing a radio interview on that religious liberty order, uh, which is the subject, that religious liberty movement is the subject of my course here at CTS. Uh, so I told my students we'd be, it would be ripped right from the headlines, and it sure was. And I understand that work as a form of activism. Uh, I also teach here, teach spiritual practice outside the academy and do other kinds of writing and work, but as my Twitter haters know, the bulk of my work these days is writing about Mr. Trump and his team. But talking about resistance is not the only form of resistance. Transmuting Audre Lorde here, intellectual and spiritual self-care is also a form of resistance, let alone when that spiritual care is of our communities, including the most vulnerable in our planet. I think as we try to understand the global shuddering taking place right now, resurgent nativism and fundamentalism in East and West, North and South, across every single religious tradition, we have to accept that something profound and profoundly disturbing is going on. There is a retrenchment happening, a return to pre-modern forms of belonging, of to primal urges of tribe and kin. We're kidding ourselves if we think this is just a coincidence or some conspiracy on the part of Vladimir Putin. This moment is a profound reflex against globalization, technology, and multiculturalism. In that context, 
progressive people of faith find ourselves at once homeless and indispensable. We are, in a sense, a third way to neoliberalism on the one hand and a revanchist nativism on the other. We speak to the profound spiritual crises of dislocation and change, but without a march backward to pseudo-religious sexism, racism, nationalism, and ethnocentrism. And yet, is anyone listening? This too, we must ask ourselves. So that's the frame, the necessary context of my thoughts today. Rabbi Michael Lerner was right, I think, 25 years ago when he urged us to consider a politics of meaning. It's not just the economy stupid, and it's not stupid. Queer theologies, liberation theologies, hybrid theologies, embodied theologies, sex positive theologies, intersectional theologies, often these are cloistered, specialized discourses. But if we tether them, tether them to the great tasks of this century, charting alternatives to neoliberal globalization and to romantic fascist land nationalism, between impoverishing consumerist materialisms and reactionary religious fanaticisms, then indeed they are ingredients in the recipe for liberation and even salvation. So I want to start, I'm going to sort of set a foundation for this Queering Jewish Theology project, and then in the next part uh, talk about seven structures that we might build on, on that foundation. One of my first Jewish teachers, uh, Rabbi Michael Paley, told me that to be a good Jew, you had to believe in one God or fewer. <laughs> that, I think, is right. That feels right to me, especially 25 years later, now that some of my post-adolescent theism has ebbed away, and I don't actually know what believe in God means. It also captures part of the reason why queer theology has been mostly a Christian enterprise, because theology in general has mostly been a Christian and Muslim enterprise. When you can, while you can tease out theologies from biblical and Talmudic texts, you won't find systematic theology or even sustained theological reflection until much later, the early medieval period, with figures like Sadia Gaon, Bachia Ibn Pekuda, and of course Maimonides. And the medieval period is the day before yesterday in Jewish time. <laughs> All of them, notably, were working with Greek, Christian, or Muslim models. We Jews came to this discourse late, and I don't think we've ever really bought into it. The old saw that Judaism is a religion of deed, not creed, is somewhat true. Conveniently, these days, there's a helpful confluence between that quasi-agnosticism and the formal agnosticism of contemporary Western life. You know, often my best answer to what's the meaning of life comes from Kurt Vonnegut, who said, we're here to help us get through this thing, whatever it is. It's actually helpful, maybe, that Judaism has staked fewer claims to cosmology now that so many religious claims must be set aside in the name of truth. That's not to say that 4,000 years of Jewish tradition was, was agnostic to the existence and reality of God, only as to what those terms meant and how important it was to figure them out. So I don't know if I, quote, believe in God because I don't know what that term means to me or to you. Martin Buber once said, if we're speaking about God in the third person, I don't know what we're talking about. But if we're speaking about God in the second person, as you right here, as this, as is, then of course I understand. That works, I think, with monism, which, which, Buddhism actually, uh, which sorry, Buber actually rejected for ethical reasons, as with Buber's th dialogical philosophy. In my, in my book, Everything is God, uh, I, I did a quote, I adapted a quote from the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, uh, which said that the, uh, the Atman does not exist, the Atman is existence itself. And tried to say that about God, that God does not exist, but God is existence itself. And today I might amend that the word God is a way of speaking about and feeling about that existence. A choice to relate to it as you rather than as it. Science calls it it. Mysticism calls it I. Love calls it you. Saying yes to the word God then becomes more about the attitude of the speaker, the practice of training the mind and the heart to open. It's helpful that the Chetagrammaton yud heh vav -Hey, has no translation other than was, is, will be, and that biblical Hebrew has no real word for is. God as is is a God in which I don't need to believe, only experience. And she is beyond and inclusive of all genders, at once silent and inclusive of all speech. Admittedly, she doesn't command or do other traditional things. That's just one set of people's way of relating to her. But she is just another way of saying you, just another way of saying is. There's only one thing I think that is says, and that, I want to suggest, is yes. One could say no. No, nothing matters. There's no significance to suffering. People are born, they die, and what happens in between is 
fundamentally meaningless. And from a certain point of view, that's true. More biomass, less biomass, more suffering, less suffering. Every, everything eventually will come to naught. But one chooses to say yes. Yes to is, yes to existence, yes to life, which means yes to human flourishing, delight, kindness, generosity, justice, and yes to concern about oppression, repression, authority, and severity. To state the obvious, religion has often excelled at oppression, repression, authority, and severity. There are plenty of theologies of severity. In the Jewish tradition, just look at the liturgy for the days of awe, and in Jewish biblical texts as well. But as for myself, having lived in that so-called closet that those theologies construct, I found in this body and in this history that they provide no reason to live. So perhaps even the yes is a queer yes. Ultimately, to say yes to life is to say no to those neo-Gnostic, anti-humanistic theologies that thwart life in the name of something else. And as a matter of religious work, it is to emphasize those aspects of a tradition that promote these more humanistic, affirming values, that it's not good to be alone, for example, that you must not oppress the stranger or the weak, that the world is beautiful and worthy of preservation. It's not that one couldn't argue the other sides of, the, of all of these propositions, only that one cannot argue the other side within the womb of the primal yes. I suspect most people in this room know these lines from Mary Oliver's Wild Geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for 100 miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. That is the yes. Audre Lorde's erotica's power is the yes. And remember, for Lorde, the erotic leads to the ethical. By experiencing the capacity of profound human connection, we learn to settle for nothing less. That connection may come in a hospital ward, in a marriage bed, in a bathhouse, or dancing around a maypole. But what comes from it, what emerges, that, as Abraham Joshua Heschel said, is what comprises religion. Not just the movement toward the numinous, the transcendent toward revelation, but the human response to it. The making of, the, of a space for the shamaim, the sky, the heavens, the infinite, in the arets, the earth, the finite, the body. And having experienced that, to design the finite as a sanctuary for the infinite. How to construct a life that's an adequate response to the vast yes that emerges in peak experiences, in love, in justice work, in liberation. How do I respond to you? Both and. Both what I've called the upward pointing triangle of the six pointed star, the part that takes us up the ladder into the deep, into the long meditation retreat or the entheogenic journey, and the downward pointing triangle into the world and the ethical and the interpersonal and the multiple. I've noticed that the emphasis seems to be almost, almost a matter of personality type. Just as the comfortable need afflicting and the afflicting needs, need comforting, so too some of us must be urged upward and inward toward the mystical, toward delight, toward love. Get to Burning Man, drink the Soma, sit on retreat for a month, do your yoga, do the work. Others of us have to be urged back downward to the world. Offer your church as a sanctuary space. Pay the bills, show up for things on time, and show up for the people who need you. In my case, the work depends on the month or even the hour. <laughs> if we're responding authentically to that yes, the yes to life, love, compassion, wisdom, then a few consequences follow quickly, and that's the subject of, of the next part. So let me very briefly sketch those seven queer structures I want to build on that foundation, seven aspects of queering Jewishness. Um, parenthetically, I've adopted a broad understanding of queer, not only in terms of the Indra's net of sexual and gender identities, but also in terms of scholarly practice. To queer is to complicate, to problematize, to undermine, to unsettle. It is to unveil the already present queerness, the mismatches between category and eros, type and gender, binary and spectrum, hierarchy and resistance, order and chaos. And because I seem constitutionally unable to do so without a symbolic structure, I've mapped those seven aspects onto the seven lower spherot, uh, the so-called tree of life from the Kabbalah, and I can't really help myself. In fact, I swore I, swore I wasn't gonna have a symbolic structure for this talk. <laughs> And then it just felt all over the place, and I had to do it. The first of these lower seven spherot, chesed, loving kindness, which in the Kabbalah is also the crossing of boundaries, the expansion. The yes, I think, is queer insofar as it transcends boundaries and categories. It is a panentheistic yes that does not confine itself. It is Whitman's multitudes without a container. 
And if queering is a process of noting the misfit between boundary and what Audre Lorde called the chaos of our deepest feelings, then the interrogation of boundaries is at the core of the practice. As my friend and previous Castaneda lecturer Patrick Chang has said, both queer love and divine love is the kind of love that crosses boundaries. But theology's boundaries are questioned as well, especially in a Jewish context rel relatively suspicious of systematic theology. In fact, the more questions may be about boundaries in and around Jewish peoplehood, identity, and belonging. For conventional Jewish personhood and identity, boundaries aren't only omnipresent, permitted, forbidden, forbidden, pure, impure, kosher, treif, Israel, other, but they're central in Israelite self-definition then and now, the chosen people, the builders of walls. Once again, Jews were ahead of the trend on, on that one. <laughs> the peculiar people, at once crossing national boundaries and drawing close boundaries around itself. And not only diasporic Israel, but Israelite religion is often a religion about boundaries because Israelites are the boundary drawers in contrast to all those boundaryless barbarians. This was a fictive construct, quoting Ken Stone, the binary opposition between Israelite and Canaanite turns out in large part to be an effect of particular biblical discourses, not reality, but discourse. Nonetheless, this was a fundamental concept, the boundary about boundaries. We are the bounded ones, they are the unbounded ones. So to question boundaries, is a radical act within a Jewish context, at least religiously speaking, beginning with the gender binary, but moving quickly to the blessing of a God who, quote, separated us from the nations, as Jews say, religious Jews say, every Saturday evening at the end of Shabbat, a creation story that, as Mary Douglas made so clear, it's all about separation, light from darkness, land from primordial water, a worldview that fears liminality so intensely that it places an amulet on every doorpost I've argued elsewhere that the significance of sexual regulation then and now is precisely this, that sexuality where chaos reigns is where the boundary making process of civilization is first marked. It's not without reason that one of the founders of the Family Research Council once said, and I quote, and this by the way is my favorite quote that I use all the time, militant homosexuality, what's that? I'd like some. Militant homosexuality is fundamentally opposed to religion, family, and anything that presupposes a natural moral order, a transcendent God, or something else higher than itself. Founder of the Family Research Council. In a certain way, he's actually right. For to transgress the boundaries of Eros is to question the other boundaries he holds dear. Patriarch patriarchal morality, patriarchal God, patriarchal family, and definitely sign me up for all of that. What might such a queering look like? Well, maybe religious hybridity or tribridity, radical questioning of any doctrine that leads to the privileging of Jewish bodies over others, up to and including prohibitions on idolatry and so-called foreign worship. Indeed, the notion of foreignness itself. Now, this is all quite convenient for me, personally, as a rabbi, as a Buddhist meditation teacher, and as a part-time pagan who believes that the soft animal of your body is holy and good and true. People often ask how I integrate these different parts of my spiritual life. You know, I teach in a Sri Lankan Theravadan Buddhist lineage, and I did the training, and I got smicha, rabbinic ordination, from one of my teachers, as well as the PhD, yada, yada, yada. I teach body electric, which combines erotic and spiritual work. I create radical fairy ritual. I've worked with shamans and medicines, and I look forward to doing so again soon. I've studied Kabbalah. I've sat for three months in silence in Nepal. I go all in, at least for a bougie white householder with a husband and a mortgage. As Marcella Althaus Reed once said, to be a queer theologian is to travel with many passports. Scholar, practitioner, activist, academic, intellectuals who talk about the body, often many gendered, many lived. And yet, honestly, this very quirky postmodern hybrid of Buddhism, Judaism, paganism, all within a non-dual embrace that is once, at once spiritual and critical of spirituality, it's just what I do, and it just feels very natural. The Jewish ethic and the Buddhist focus on suffering and the pagan embrace of life's multiple energies, they all intertwine without any effort for me. You know, it's just that postmodern Western pragmatism colored by capitalist spiritual bricolage. <laughs> and yet the rejection of the concept of boundary, that which enables that blending, is informed and suffused by a particular queer perspective. So number two, Gavura, uh, boundary uh, and difference. There is a, so there's a crossing of boundaries, even those between permitted and forbidden inside and outside, crossed, though not erased. 
as I've written elsewhere, there's an interesting irony in non-dualistic theolo theologies that they embrace multiplicity and polytheism and manifestation much more than effacement and blanklet, blankness. You might think if everything is nothing and emptiness is form, that your spiritual life might be somewhat austere in imitation of that. But in fact, if you look at whether it's the theological polymorphism of the Kabbalah or the polytheism of Hindu Vedanta or the pleroma of Tibetan Buddhism, in fact, more unity seems to go hand in silk glove with more Baroque detail of God, goddesses, infinite manifestations. And this, of course, allows for a wide, perhaps infinite range of divine faces, identities, genders, not just a divine feminine here but, or there, but a divine plenitude of gender, more on the queer Kabbalah in a moment. These are bounded identities, but they're also so numerous, so ever-changing, and so polysemous that they understand, undermine the whole concept of fixity in divinity. Boundaries crossed but not erased, and thus the recognition of limitation, of particularity, of difference. My selection criteria, including those of why this theology resonates and those do not, are themselves determined in part by my queer experience, my queer life, doubtless from a differently gendered or racialized or historical, cultural, national, or class-based perspective, I would have different criteria. There's no foundation of foundations. There are no skyhooks, and nothing is more culturally contingent than some claim to objective truth. The first tenet of any queer theology must be that there is no first tenet, which is why I'm doing this one second. <laughs> our experiences and our narratives, necessarily multiple, dictate multiple starting points. They're still starting points. I'm not gonna just throw up my hands in and there, but they're conditioned as all phenomena are. They're part of the postmodern matrix of culturally constructed causes, conditions, identities. Difference, multiplicity, multi-perspectival, not objectivity and foundationalism. This theology is like looking into the infinite and seeing an infinity of mirrors. It's at once cataphatic and apophatic. Cataphatic because there are those infinite images Apophatic because none is wholly veridical. No mystical experience is it in itself. No philosophical argument, set of attributes, preferences, dogmas, nothing. To speak truly of God and God's self is to invite contradiction because the infinite transcends the ability to, of logic to divide, discern, and understand. Even familiar theological concepts like omnipresence, omnipotence, omnibenevolence are selected for reasons that come from histories, that come from bodies, that come from experiences. Every label is a form of limitation, including the label of no label. The opposite of queer is normal, the normative, the norm. Difference, as contrasted with normativity, is thus a hallmark of queerness. The task of queering Jewish theology can never totally succeed to the extent that a theology is meant to be normative and totalizing. The first principle of a queer Jewish theology is that there is no one queer Jewish theology. To queer Jewish theology means to erase aspirations to being total, especially when those discourses are spoken by some on behalf of others who are excluded from conversation. Third, tiferet, beauty, harmony, love. Love is as strong as death, says the Song of Songs. For the Jewish philosopher Franz Rosenzweig, this means that eros can coexist with thanatos, Love does not conquer death, but it is as strong as it is. It coexists with it. Love becomes a primary word, the word you for Buber, the encounter for, with the other, and the encounter with the numinous. Devotional love, the sacred, the mystery, the transcendent experience, that is indeed your birthright. Please, if you haven't done all of those things I said before, the seven-day retreat or the serious medicine retreat or chanted ecstatically or had the full-body orgasm or glimpsed the profound motion and spirit that impels all thinking things, please do these things. <laughs> Mystical experience are only the beginning of the religious sentence, but please don't skip to the end. As we proceed from the unknowability of the infinite to the God who relates to the world, love is the first primary word. You know, Western mystics often express their relationship to God in erotic terms, and it's no mere metaphor. In the oneness of the one, a great knowing love naturally flows. As mystics and contemplatives know from their experience, compassion and love arise spontaneously from a place of enlightened wisdom. Love flows from our experience of the divine and the divine is more readily knowable in the rich multiple meanings that term has in Hebrew, in love. Along the path, we can experience intense love for the divine and an awareness of God present in our love as we experience it with our lovers. To be holy is to be on fire with love, for love is the essence of contemplative life. 
and for queers, how we experience love of other humans affects how we experience the love of God. If love is the essence of our relationship to the one, then how we experience love affects how we know the one. God as experienced by a gay cisgender man is different from God as experienced by a heterosexual transgender woman, and so on through all the permutations. Indeed, that's one of the great gifts of the multiple diversities that we can experience, sexual and gender diversity, just one among many. The abundant proliferation of fingers pointing at the moon. Moreover, anyone who has grown up in a non-affirming community or a family must go through a certain process of negation and affirmation. In such a case, and of course this is a particular experience, not a universal one, one is told that how one loves is wrong, that it is an incorrect choice, that it's not in accord with a life well lived. And at some point, one must see that these statements are false, that how one loves is right, that it is not an incorrect choice, that it is in accord with a life well lived. This inversion teaches in an experiential way the primacy of love. Even for, those, even for those of us who were never denied in that way, we must still return again and again to the source of our knowing, our love, when jabbed at by the fingers of bigots. Our love is not taken for granted, not widely reinforced. It's something that we come to know. Now, there are those whose fundamental modality remains fear. Fear of difference, fear of their own unexplored shadow, fear of losing that which they care about uh, by accepting that which seems threatening. And again, it's certainly possible not to have happiness and flourishing as values to be cherished. That is to say no instead of yes. But personally, I think, probably because of my own experiences in a repressive closet for much of my teens and 20s, it just it doesn't cohere. You know, I, have a, I have a religious cousin, really one of the gayest people I know, um, who's made his choice to live his life in that no. His Orthodox family would disown him if he came out. And he loves them, and he loves the Jewish community. He loves Yiddishkeit. And so even though he's gayer than Liberace, well, not really, not that gay. And even though he's a femme single man in his 40s in a community in which everyone gets married in their 20s, and even though his is the clearest glass closet in America, that's okay because he doesn't tell and his family doesn't, act, doesn't ask. Can I refute this way of living? I think he's just shining down on me. Right now. <laughs> can I say, can I refute that way of living? I, I don't know. I know it's not for me. I know it runs contrary to my own values. And I know it does actually matter. I'd like to be able to refute it. But I'm not sure I can, other than to rest back into the yes, into the is, into the being that loves, and see if it makes any sense, which in that place, it does not. Number four, netzach, eternity, ancestors. Family, kinship, roots, ancestors, these are central not just in Judaism, but surely in any organized religious community. Not all Jews have the childhood associations that Jews by birth do, of my grandmother's recipes or the heirlooms inherited from God knows where, but it's striking that even Jews by choice are given a new set of Jewish parents, so to speak, when they convert. Welcome to the mishpacha, welcome to the family. But who are my ancestors? As a queer, skeptical, multi-identified Jew, my ge genealogy looks more like rhizomes than roots. I owe one of the most important Jewish theological revolutions in, in my life to a, a good friend of mine, and a colleague, Rabbi Jill Hammer, who co-founded the Kohenet Hebrew Priestess Institute, which quite consciously explores and reinvents the forms of female-led religiosity that were prohibited by a biblical Hebrew priesthood. Jill invites all of us, but I want to focus on the queer invitation in particular, to ask who our ancestors are. Are they the priestly elites who banned gender variant and feminine-led cultic worship? Or are they the people who are being banned? Who are my ancestors as a queer progressive sex positive spiritual hybrid in a 21st century anti-oppression context? The answer seems clear. If it was banned by the priests and later banned by the rabbis, probably it was banned because people like me were doing it. This, it seems to me, is a step further than the so-called search for a usable past, uh, which David Roskies has well adapted to Judaism. It goes further even than diving into the wreck in Adrian Rich's absolutely essential words. That poem is more or less the credo of my Judaism. Because in this case, there are wrecks beside the wreck, other ships that this one has rammed and destroyed, whose shape we can only make out by inference. This, it seems to me, is reconstructing or perhaps reinventing a past that is more usable than the one which history has preserved. It's the opposite of apologetics. It's not trying to preserve some vestige of an illusion of a continuity with something that wasn't as bad as it actually surely was. 
In addition to being false consciousness, apologetics tend to flatten the past into a somewhat similar analog of the present, whereas surely it's more fruitful to see the past in all its weirdness, all its foreignness, its strangeness, whether that alterity is just or unjust. To be sure, resurrecting vanished ancestors is in part an act of imagination. Do we really know what Asherah goddess worship looked like in Iron Age Canaan? Not in detail. But there are some shards of the pot, and from those we'll build a reconstruction. Informed, too, by Jewish reconstructors who have gone before, such as the Zohar, the masterpiece of the Kabbalah, which says that Asherah, one of the, the, the big bad <laughs> goddesses of those bad Canaanites, is actually just another name for the Shekhinah, the divine feminine. An astonishing, astonishing heretical utterance on the part of the Zohar. Queers might find ancestors in the effeminized Isaac, the twink Jacob Israel, the aesthete mystic Betzalel, Ruth and Naomi, David and Jonathan, as well as female heroes such as Esther, Deborah, and Yael, who took on positions of agency despite patriarchal power, or to Leah, who owned her own sexuality, or to Vashti, who dared to own her own body and was punished for it. Queers might also look to marginalized figures with multiple meanings, names, identities, from the dismembered concubine in the Book of Kings to the night angels who accost Moses and his uncircumcised son. Closer to my own work, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Jacob Frank, a heretical leader active in the, la in the late 18th century. Frank was a sinister figure in many respects, but he was also sexual, skeptical, transgressive. He ridiculed piety and religion, and in so doing was more religious than the pious. Merely by offering a counter-history, heretics like Frank offer a liberating potential. That's one reason, I think, why many feminists and, queer, feminists and queers have embraced the Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical and esoteric tradition, despite its fundamental gender binarism and nationalist conservatism. I came to explore the wreck, Adrian Rich. The words are purposes. The words are maps. I came to see the damage that was done and the treasures that prevail. Kabbalah contains many of those treasures, goddess language, gender play, a recognition that gender is a matter of the soul rather than the physical anatomy, mystics who become female aspects, of, male mystics who become female aspects of the divine in order to unite with male aspects of the divine, an autoeroticized god delighting in God's self prior to differentiation, and not coincidentally, texts such as the Zohar which recognize the other side and other gods as partial truths rather than Manichaean evils to be destroyed. These are some of the ancestors who I wish to select. Five, Hod, delight. Hod, or splendor, is in the Kabbalah the aspect of wow, of ecstasy, delight, brilliance, the shining moment, the zipless fuck, the transcendent entheogenic merging with the infinite lattice of being, the peak experience, you know, all of that. And both transcendent and imminent, pleasure, sex, body, earth. Ponder the real birds and the bees, the overwhelming overabundance of sex, plumage, honey, architecture, song, hardly just love and reproduction. Could we teach the real birds and the bees instead of the made up ones? And both the fireworks and justice to which we'll return in a moment. One metaphor I like here is William Blake's image of the marriage of heaven and hell. The virtue of heaven, the pleasure of hell. The ethics of heaven, the sensuousness and vitality of hell. And also, the sufficiency of a quiet evening with red wine and a fireplace. Hode does not have to be fireworks or theology, for that matter. There's a sweet skepticism in that simple, in simple Epicurean delights of the world. If I'm going to queer theology, it's going to go well with lamb stew on a cold winter night. <laughs> with apologies to the vegans. <laughs> Questioning Western theological projections onto our bodies, we come to know our bodies more. We are invited to explore the parameters of pleasure. We do not rest within assumptions and transmute for, and we transmute, for example, the Jewish exhortations to conjugal fulfillment into an embodied, eroticized uh, post-monotheism that unites the earthly with the heavenly. Outside even mysticism's heteronormativity, we come to know our souls more, a spectrum of permutations replacing the binary uniting of, quote, opposites. We embody and in soul not just male and female aspects of the divine, but the aspects of the divine which transcend all of those binaries. We don't fear to take on the roles of each, like the patriarch Isaac, who the Kabbalists identify with the feminine aspect of the divine, or King David, who represents the Shekhinah, the feminine aspect of the divine. There is no normative experience of pleasure. On the contrary, it's the deviation rather than the essence, which is the fundamental aspect, the plurality of engenderings. 
To be a queer mystic is to be the ultimate verse, the ultimate switch. As a genderqueer friend of mine wrote on their Facebook recently, today my gender is all over the place. <laughs> Number six, you sowed uh, justice. From that central emanation, the central pillar of what has gone before, from the yes through love comes the foundational understanding that suffering is wrong. This is Yasod foundation, generativity, that is, the generativity of the world. And conversely, from suffering comes the yes. Let me say, given suffering, yes. The suffering of colonialism, of white supremacy, of anti-Semitism, the resistance to that is yes. But I mean it not in, in, a, in a certain way, not they tried to kill us and they didn't, so let's be strong and ethnocentric and kill them first, but rather to not allow any allegedly higher concept to oppress or repress others, to make ethics primary. An ethical priority is given to those theologies that value flourishing over non-flourishing. It is not uniquely queer to prefer the yes, but it is necessary for queers to do so. From the plenitude of life comes Richard Wordy's sole moral postulate that cruelty is the worst thing we can do. The particulars of ethical responsibility do not flow naturally from that postulate, hence the Talmud and its arguments and the evolution of the moral sensibility, but the general imperative does flow in such a way. So does a rejection of about 90% of what our government has been doing for the last five months. Another way of putting it is the dharmic insight that suffering is the problem, which likewise for me flows from this yes of queer positive theology. So Audre Lorde, one more time. The erotic is a measure between our sense of self and the chaos of our strongest feelings. It is an internal sense of satisfaction to which once we have experienced, we know we can aspire. For having recognized the fullness of this depth of feeling and recognizing its power, in honor and self-respect, we can require no less of ourselves. For Lord, and I think the body positive queer, the erotic functions like Heschel's radical amazement. The experience of the profound, of satisfaction and of relationship causes us to require no less of ourselves in terms of living life justly, ethically, boldly. The passion and connection of Eros is thus intrinsically queer because it is self-shattering and world-forming. And yet we also know evil when we see it even if we do not define it ontologically. We know it cannot be tolerated, what destroys life and love. Evil is the no in its radical life-killing forms or its more subtle soul-killing ones. Closing myself off from the suffering of another. This is why there are so few conservative mystics and meditators, since to open to experience is to open to the suffering that I may be causing, that I may be complicit in. Or, Choosing that dark side of anger and personal will over compassion and forbearance, we err when we make evil into some cosmic mysterious force. It is banal, it is here in a thousand mundane acts. Worse, this evil can feel natural and moral goodness can feel unnatural. I want the most of everything, the biggest, the best words, the golden, goldest gilded palaces, the hugest. And that wanting animal is part of the beating heart of the world. But too much yes becomes a no to the other. Cruelty is ugly, no matter how much tacky gold leaf is inlaid upon it. My favorite verse of the Bible appears almost a, a dozen times. One of the forms in Exodus 22, uh, do not oppress the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And there are, two, there are two pieces to that verse that are so important. You know, there's a Jewish concept that any words of the Torah are there for a reason. And the second half of that sentence is seemingly redundant. Why doesn't God just say, don't oppress the stranger? Don't oppress the widow and the orphan? We don't need a reason. God doesn't need to provide a reason. Why not just say it? I think the reason the second part of the sentence is there is that implicitly, sadly, we humans have the capacity not to do that. We have a capacity to forget our own contingency, to rest in the blindness of our privilege, to oppress the weakest as soon as we ourselves are no longer among them or perceive ourselves to no longer be among them. In other words, there are two commandments in that verse repeated a dozen times in the Torah. First, to remember and inhabit the position of marginality as best we can, and to learn from those who embody positions different from our own. And it, from the basis of that knowledge, of that ethical revelation, to act justly. And yet, we queers fall down on this just as much as American Jews do. The profundity of that moral teaching is lost in the racism, sexism, and ageism of every gay bar, except for maybe one or two, 
that you would visit. We fail to recognize the intersectionality of oppressions and the solidarity that we have with other oppressed groups. By contrast, it's a wonderful line from Allen Ginsberg in uh, Wichita Vortex Sutra. I'm an old man now and a lonesome man in Kansas, but not afraid to speak my lonesomeness because it's not only my lonesomeness. It's ours all over America and spoken lonesomeness is prophecy. Spoken brokenness is a prophetic call to justice. Finally, number seven, uh, Malchut, and the question of roles for queers in the world. Finally, today, for today anyway, are the ways in which queers and queering specifically contribute to a wider awakening of wisdom and compassion. Here, I must say, I've gone through a lot of phases. There was a time when the heart of my queer theology was, was this question. Does sexual and gender diversity matter? Or is it simply a random variant trait like eye color, for a different eye color, for example? It, and if it's significant in some articulable ways, what are they? And at that time in my life, I was inspired to discover others who were asking those questions. Harry Hay, for example, the gay spirituality movement, feminist theologians, womanist theologians. And I'm still interested in those questions. What's beyond rhetorics of equality? What discourses of difference are there? What are the verses that queers contribute to the play of life more broadly? You know, just as I, as a man, have learned, say, from feminist theologians, just as I, as a white person, have learned from theologians of color, what can, what can we say might everyone learn from queer theologians and theologies? But two reservations have crept in over the last few years. First, I'm really I'm concerned about essentialism, that there's some laundry list of gay or queer traits gifts or talents or whatever that you're supposed to have. Essentialism to me is actually the opposite of queering with its emphasis on difference and multiplicity. And yet it seems inevitable if we say X or Y traits are intrinsically queer, or LGBT or gay or what have you, you know, that actually flattens difference and implies that if you don't have those traits or interests, you must be doing gay wrong. <laughs> that, that can't be the right track. Second, there's an aspect of justification that I wonder about in these gay gifts discourses, as if here's why God made, gay, my, God made people queer, and good thing there's a reason, because otherwise we'd have no value. That too can't be the right direction. So I'm still interested in queerness and limer, in liminality, how queers walk between genders and sex roles and are like shamans walking between worlds. I'm still interested in how those shamanic roles are transmuted into secular popular culture, uh, queer eye for the straight guy, capitalist shamanism, for example ecstatic ritual on dance clubs and circuit parties, the archaic revival. I'm interested in the trickster sensibility with its camp and its irony, that queers are often the jesters who can speak truth to the king, who stand outside social conventions and critique them. I'm interested in how the multiple passports we queers carry, the multiple drags we don and doff lead to a realization that RuPaul is right, that it's all drag, all identities, roles, appearances. It's not nothing, but it's drag not essence. I certainly love the queer potential to question hierarchies, dominations, binaries, how that might translate internally as well into investigating our own shadows, refusing to rest in easy dualisms of light and dark, good and evil. The farther we get away from any notions of what identity is supposed to be, the closer we are to realization. And sure, I'm interested in how repression has led queers to innovation, how queer mystics are sublime sublimators. As I wrote around 12 years ago in an early sketch of this talk <laughs> called Toward a Queer Jewish Theology, I'm now quoting myself, <laughs> would I have turned to meditation if I'd felt no pain of exclusion? Would I walk alone in the, in the woods seeking God if I'd been fully satisfied with my intimate life? I think as the years have passed, I experience this sublimation less, but I must acknowledge it, it probably plays a role. Certainly, I love the homoerotic teachings of Rumi and Hafiz or Sappho or thousands of other mystics. And as I also wrote 12 years ago, quote, queer religiosity does not require repression and is not reducible to a neurotic response to it. We can view spirituality as a collection of half-truths we use to balm our wounds. We can cynically wink at the coincidence of the unloved soul feeling universal love. But if we do that, we must also flatten every work of art into sensory titillation and reduce our joy at childbirth to gametes. In the Jewish frame in particular, I appreciate how a queer perspective recognizes that even the most elaborate of legal interpretations is but the choreography of a moon dance. 
To imbue this tradition with near immutability, as do many of my co-religionists, strikes me as a ludicrous confusion. And if my own exclusion from that tradition hasten my disillusionment with it, in the best sense, disillusion, then it was indeed a blessing. But are queers really a nation of priests as the Israelites said themselves to be? I don't know. Even 12 years ago, I asked, is such essentialism at odds with the idea of queerness itself? I know that for myself, I did not fight for the right to be normal, as Senator Barney Frank once said. I honor those who did. But for myself, if I've been fighting for anything, it's for me the right to take apart the normal, question the normal, undermine the normal, because the normal often blows. <laughs> so by way of conclusion, everyone's favorite words at the end of a long talk. There are a number of things I, I haven't talked about, but my time is up. You might have noticed that I didn't touch on some of the usual cornerstones of Jewish theology. I've said very little about Torah, about creation, revelation, and redemption, about the Messiah or death or the normative value of Jewish law. I haven't talked about these things mostly because I'm not interested in them. <laughs> also, I, I've said things about them before with varying degrees of authenticity. What I've talked about today are aspects of Jewishness and queerness that interest and inspire me, diving into the wreck. As I've said, some queer perspectives are born from a kind of alienation between subjective experience and received tradition. The book says Adam and Eve, but I'm into Steve. Even without the ongoing horror stories of persecution and rejection, just that dissonance between experience and text is enough to slip a wedge into the seams. It's not like they told you. And as soon as that seam is opened, well, then we're into the problems of subjectivity and choice and individualism that more or less caused modernity. I think that by admitting that I'm selecting the treasure among the wreck, I'm not actually doing anything so novel. We all select what treasures we wish to extract. But at least there's some transparency rather than a pretense of historical authenticity or some unbroken lineage or whatever. The world wasn't created 6,000 years ago. It wasn't created by a man in the sky. The man in the sky didn't write this book or make a baby. It's OK to masturbate, and science is real. I don't know what the word God really means, but whatever it means, it must have something to do with truth, the way things are, what is. Yes, just how it is, just this now. Maybe not a mystical now, a be here now, a power of now. Maybe just for now. And so, in fact, I want to end on a down note, a note of fear and uncertainty and sadness. As the handful of people who read my last book, uh, The Gate of Tears, Sadness in the Spiritual Path, know uh, I'm much happier being truthfully sad than being untruthfully happy. That's the love of God I understand the resting in what's true, rather than trying to make it otherwise. That really does awaken a love in my heart and a happiness that does not depend on conditions. And really, truly, in its coexistence with sadness, like two notes of a minor chord, that kind of happiness nourishes me more than conventional pleasures, which, as you can tell, I certainly appreciate. So I don't know about us humans. The yes is my theology, my choice, but I don't know is the truth before the choice. Both the I don't know in the open mystical sense, but also I don't know in the sense of, I don't know if our species is really meant to have this much power, especially with boys in charge. I think most progressives are understandably so focused on the immediate threats to ourselves, our friends, our country, and our planet that we don't have, to have the luxury to reflect on the profound darkness inside the human spirit that has been revealed over the last two years in our world. Erdogan to Modi, Putin to Trump, Le Pen to Brexit, the occupation of Tibet and the concentration camps of North Korea, resurgent conservatives in South America and opportunistically anti-Western despots in Sub-Saharan Africa, fundamentalists in the Middle East, genocidal dictators in the Middle East. In addition to the grave dangers we face, is there not also an unwanted philosophical reminder of the profound shortcomings in the human condition? If religion is the primal yes to life, there are plenty of reasons to say, I don't know. For 30 years, I've been trying to understand what factors determine whether someone becomes generally progressive or generally conservative. I've read a lot on that subject. Some of the factors are genetics, some have to do with early childhood, our experiences, nature and nurture, all that. Very few later interventions, however, really seem to work other than trauma. That's the exhortation of Exodus 22. Remember your pain or the historical memory 
of your pain and don't inflict it on others. Does spirituality work, meditation, religion, philosophy, psychedelics, family, sharing memes on Facebook? I don't know. I can find examples of all of those being turned to evil or less profoundly to materialism, narcissism, ego. The jury, it seems, is still out on whether enough humans can save us from ourselves or whether the best of us will make beautiful art, words, and love that will soon be washed away, just as Ecclesiastes proposes. Nevertheless, we persist. Thank you. Won't you join me again in thanking the rabbi? <laughs> My professor. <laughs> Dr. Michelson has really given us a feast tonight. And we have only a short period of time to take a few questions. Um, we don't want to tire him out too much. But I know that you have questions because it was so rich, right? What I'm going to do is just take this mic down and then I'll bring it back and forth. So if you have a question, actually there's a mic right there. So if you have a question, go to the mic and let's see how this conversation unfolds. We're going to take about 15 minutes, roughly. Oh, really? It's, it's too, like, Jimmy Kimmel or something. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Stephen Colbert, I don't know. Well, I don't think you want to be shy, cut your time down to 10 minutes. <laughs> I can also repeat the question if you don't feel like standing up and going to the mic. You can just ask it. So one of my favorite uh, queer non-theologians, uh, Judith Butler, writes that what constitutes being human, or maybe a chance of becoming human, is being undone by the other. And that is queerness. And that is scary. And that is scary for people based on their different contexts. So I was wondering if you could talk more about maybe the uh, ability of navigating the vulnerability of queerness. Mm. Yeah, it's funny, and um, you know, as I've said, you know, I have these two careers, and they're often at, at odds with each other, the hard-edged journalist thing and the softy meditation teacher thing. But in the last year, it there feels like there's been a real convergence, right? Because we can just see those processes that you described manifesting. I mean, it has, it, it's hard to think of a figure as, as fascinating as, and dark as their president, who is cl so clearly a you know, this vast existential pain that he's unaware of and, and so blissfully unaware of it, right? That it's, it's almost like you wanna, don't wanna tap him on the shoulder and say, you know, it's pretty obvious what you're doing here, We're talking about your hugeness and your big hotels and stuff. Um, but I think that's right. And I, I think that goes to me, what, what I'm taking from your, your point and Judith Butler's point, it has, does have to do with our, our moment. And, you know, post-election, there was a lot of rhetoric about, well, let's try to understand the white working class more and all that stuff, even though the data actually pointed that the best predictor of support for Trump in that environment had to do with, with racism, not with economic dislocation. But, so there's been a lot of that kind of thing, but I think a deeper dive into it, as you, as you said, does have to do with these primal human needs that are not met for some um, in a world of technology and globalization. And for them, I think the queer piece is that multiculturalism is added into that. So a lot of folks who are progressive would also have heavy critiques of technology, the way that technology and globalization has changed human interaction. But for many of us, 
it's like, well, multiculturalism, that doesn't belong in there. I mean, that's, that's a good thing. That's a good change that's happened. And yet, I think that fear of queerness that you're talking about, that fear of difference, um, is part of that bundling, you know? To, so how can we make America great again, make it Christian again in a certain sense of what that means, make it white supremacist again, make it male dominated again? And that's this, this yearning that we can share, I think, of that space of brokenness. And it really is about what do we do with that yearning? So one option is to kind of say, yeah, here's that brokenness that's there. Mm -hmm. And you know, quoting, and Leonard Cohen, right, that's, that's where the light gets in, right? The crack in everything. Another is to say, there is no crack in everything. I've already sealed it up. It's sealed up with gold cement. And don't tell me about cracks and don't threaten anything that threatens you know, my collection of people who are just like me and we're all in agreement as to what the good life looks like and it looks like me. And I, I think it's that, so I think that, I think that Judith Butler's insight there is so right and it transcends it transcends some of class and politics and so forth in the wound. And then the question is, what do we do with the wound? And that, in that response, I think is the, is the vast gulf um, or gulfs that emerge uh, in our society. Menachem and I co-founded the first Jewish camp at Burning Man in 2003. Yeah. 2003. AJ. My question is, you, you referenced um, that we're not just dealing with people's opinions, right, with people who are not on the queer side, not on, on the conservative side, and the change in them takes trauma, which is really fascinating. So what are one or two thoughts you have about, like, on a daily basis, you know, in, our, in the nitty-gritty of our lives, what we can do? Traumatize all Republicans. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, is, what does constructive trauma look like, or what does it look like to counter, you know, the conservative non-queer sort of elements? Well, that's, yeah, that, thank you. I, you know, I, I, think, I think that's part of the question, right? And that's what I, so many students here at CTS are occupied with, right? What does anti-oppression really look like in terms of what, is it possible to open the heart? For a while, when I was starting out teaching meditation 15, 20 years ago, I thought I really felt in my own self that that transformation through spiritual practice. And I really, I really became, I had the zeal of the converted. And just really briefly, we're very short on time. That might have only one more question. But um, I was leading a meditation sit, and someone moved. And instead of feeling angry at that person for moving, I legitimately felt instinctually compassion. And that was kind of a huge opening for me that me, the biggest jerk in the world, could actually feel compassion naturally, not because I ought to, but actually feel it that way. And I'd like to think that those moments of human interaction, it doesn't have to be on some meditation retreat, could actually have that power, uh, that to really encounter the other, especially the marginalized other. Um, and we've seen some success with that when stories, let's say, of undocumented folks or folks with families with some undocumented folks, the families are, are torn apart, that some people on the fence realize, oh, wow, maybe this isn't such a good idea. You know, and there's li those little incremental pieces. But I, again, I, I think I ended, I chose to end on that sort of note of uncertainty because it's been a real process for me of, of sad disillusionment this, this past six months, not just about the persistence of, of all forms of oppression in our society, but again, around the world. And so I don't actually have a, a confident answer for what that would look like. Um, and I, I, think that's, if I, I think that's the struggle. And it's gonna, de it's gonna depend on communities and our different positions that we can speak from. Um, I'd like to think that there are some answers, and I've listed two or three of them just now, but I don't have confidence. All right, last one. Hi. Hey. Um, so I'm 22 and coming to queerness very new um, compared to a lot of people in this room. And uh, coming to queerness in an age when queer is becoming more and more subsumed into the normal. And you talked about normalcy as something that blows, I think, was <laughs> your terminology. Um, Sorry to use all that philosophical language. Right. And... So I'm, I'm wondering how you speak to your students and to young people you're working with about navigating queerness and what queerness means without essentializing it in an age when it's becoming more and more normalized and subsumed into this normalcy that blows. Thank you, yeah, that's an awesome point, question. 
Yeah, you know, I think one thing I've reacted against in the, in the cis gay male space, there's been a lot of language about how the wound of homophobia is the fundamental experience of, of being a gay man. And that may be true for many of us, including many, pe many people in this room, but it's interesting to see that not be the case for, for more and more people. And that's just talking about privileged cisgender gay guys, let alone the full spectrum of, of queerness. Um, you know, for me, I think what's delightful about the word queer is that it has these different meanings. And I joke, uh, I shouldn't say this because we're recording it or streaming it, but I joke that a lot of my friends in the Bay Area are quinos, queer in name only, because it's kind of cool to be queer, even though they're heterosexual dudes who have never, like, whatever, like, but they're like, no, it's cool, I'm queer. Um, and actually, although I make fun of them and just did, um, <laughs> There is something really nice about that because at least there's some understanding that queerness is also about patriarchy, that it's also about power, that it's also like, I mean, if one of, the, if one of my Quino friends started mansplaining, we could definitely call him out on that, right? Because queering and mansplaining don't go that well together, I don't think, right? Because for a variety of reasons. So there's actually something I think helpful about, about that and to me also, and maybe this is contentious, but maybe not, to, to me the term queer is intrinsically an intersectional term, uh, whereas gay and lesbian and bisexual are not, and trans, anyway, let's just say gay, lesbian, bisexual. Like, it's not, you know, there are clearly conservative gays out there, right? Milo and all those other guys and so on. And it is true that if you see your, your gayness, if you're privileged enough to be able to see your gayness as, well, now I'm in the country club, and so isn't the country club awesome? Right? And that is the view of millions of people in, in our country. And they are now in the country club. They are now accepted. Their same-sex partner, legally married, is accepted. And so, but that to me is not a queer perspective. Um, it's missing the point that the country club itself is problematic. Right? Well, and, and so that is what I think is, it, so it's, it's about, rem, it's about reinvigorating or remembering or reinforcing those intrinsically intersectional destabilizing elements of queerness. And they're recognizing the already queer too, right? One way to like do LGBT studies in the Bible is to go gay hunting. And so you can have like a lot of time, like were Ruth and Naomi doing it or not? And is that, you know, does it, do they count? Is that in and, or not? You know, and, and I think that's, you know, obviously really not that fruitful. First, because it flattens, right, what, what female, female intimacy might look like. That's Adrian Rich again, right? Um, uh, in, in, in her work, um, but even more so because we're not hunting for people who look like, who fit this particular, we're not hunting for purple people, right? We're recognizing that everybody's a little bit lavender. And that I think is liberating and perhaps revolutionary. Thank you again. Gathered in our varied faiths, journeys, and paths. Gathered in our diverse contexts, races, gender identities, sexualities, and abilities. Gathered in our desire and passion for a better world. Gathered in our frustrations, anger, agony, and pain. Gathered in our love, joy, laughter, and abundance, gathered in our bodies that escape labels, definitions, and boundaries, gathered in our individual and collective queerness, and in that which is yet unnamed and is to come, we leave. But not alone, together, with our anger and our joy, with our bodies and our queerness. Now may the God who is queer, who escapes our words and our boundaries in the midst of the cloud, perhaps as the mist, continue to elude our grasp and beckon us forth. And may our desire for God who is truly other, the other, 
become known in our relationships with those who are other to us. The immigrant and the refugee, the trans and the gender non-conforming, the butch and the femme, the escort and the sex worker, our neighbors. May God who moves in bodies, through bodies, between bodies, and as bodies, move our bodies towards greater justice and mercy. Go in peace.